minutes for January 8th, 2020. I'll move that we approve the minutes from the last meeting. And I'll second. Got a motion by Maureen and a second by Brenda. We'll go down the line. Matt? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Maureen? Yes. John? Uh, abstain. Brenda? Yes. Amy? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Uh, next is the report of the chair and the vice chair. Um, other than the loss of yet another planning commissioner, I have nothing to report. Brenda, do you have anything to report? No. Nothing to report. Okay, and then we'll hear a report from the director. He sort of stole the words out of my mouth. Uh, so, <laughs> as most of you probably know, Darren Lana was uh, going to represent District 5 on the City Council, so congratulations to him. And he just passed through, so he's somewhere in here. But um, So if you know anybody who you think would be a great planning commissioner, um, Districts 5 and 6 would be ideal. If you know anybody, please let us know. <laughs> We're starting with a blank uh, sheet right now, so we would love to find someone. So if you know anybody, either send it my way or send it to Michaela. And that's all I had. Sure. All you've got. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll now move on to the public hearing portion. The first item on the agenda is the East Liberty Commons plan development. It's actually two matters. We've got PLN SUB 2019-00904 and PLN SUB 2019-00987 and Linda. Good evening, commissioners. So the project before you requires a plan development and preliminary subdivision approvals to develop six new lots with frontage on a 20-foot wide sh private street. So there's the two planning petitions associated with the request. The plan development requires any creation of lots th that do not front a public sh street. So therefore, this proposal is requesting it to be on a private street. The second is the preliminary subdivision for the consolidation of the lots. There are two parcels, and then therefore to create six new lots for the constructions of six new single family homes. So the existing site. The proposed site consists of two adjoining parcels located at approximately 102 and 108 South, 1100 East. Currently there are two four unit residential buildings with a private driveway with access off of 1100 East, as you can see here. And the project site is zoning within the R1 5000 zoning district. Therefore the existing residential building is actually a non-conforming use. The adjacent surrounding properties are also zoned R15000 and contain single family structures. The Planning Commission reviewed a similar project back in February 2017 and denied the request. But the proposed project today has been revised to reduce the number of zoning reliefs and in, to include the reduction of the number of lots, previously seven and now today you're seeing six lots. In addition, they're addressing the concerns of compatibility with the surrounding neighborhoods. The project seeks to demolish the existing structures and create six new lots accessed by a 20-foot wide private street. As you can see here, the private street is shaded in gray. And each lot would meet the minimum requirements of the underlying zoning districts, as you can find in attachment F of the staff report. So with the exception of lot one, the front facade of the proposed single family residence would be oriented towards that private street. As a result, the proposed development has designated the established yards to ensure that the orientation of the building when they are constructed would front the private street. And the established yard tables is actually in the staff report in table two. In addition, the preliminary subdivision plat identifies the building envelopes. As you can see here are the lot coverage compared to the surrounding. The proposed envelopes are similar to the adjacent properties, as you can see ranging between 26 to 36 percent, where the maximum coverage is 40 percent. The applicant plans to sell each lot individually for the construction of six family, single family homes with the design of each home to be determined by the future buyers. The applicant anticipates that the average building height would be approximately 24 feet, as you can see here. This is just a conceptual elevation where a maximum height of 28 feet is allowed measured to the top of the ridge. And on average, the building footprint would be approximately 1,600 square feet. Each proposed structure would provide two off-street parking within the attached garage and to be entered in through the side facade, not through the front. And the exterior materials proposed would consist of brick or stone and durable materials. 
So overall, the proposal would include common areas, a pedestrian walkway, and six guest parking, as you can see, spread throughout the development, where the, in addition to landscape buffering with fencing along the perimeter of the project site. As you can see here, I know it's a little bit hard on the screen, it's adequately landscaped to include shrubs, bushes, and trees that are strategically placed to ensure that it creates privacy for the development and also to lessen potential impacts to the surrounding neighborhood. These are site visit photos. So starting at the top left is a view of the private drive from 1100 East, and top right would be the private driveway looking onto 1100 East. And the subsequent photos is taken from the interior of the lot and facing the abutting neighborhoods. So bottom left is looking at the northwest corner of the abutting properties along that way. And to the bottom right, you'll see the northern portion of that west property line. And then here is the southern portion, top right. Top left would be, sorry, top left would be the southern portion of the west property line. And then in the southwest corner on the top right here, you'll see the existing trees in the plans, in the landscape conceptual plans, some of these trees will remain, assuming as long as it doesn't impact the buildable um, area, which it doesn't. And the bottom left is abutting properties to the south, and the property to the south is kind of similar to the existing site, where it's just one structure on a very large lot, approximately like 35,000 square feet. And lastly, the bottom right is the southeast corner, and also here, you'll see the existing trees along the east property line would also remain. So there are three considerations, three key considerations, the first being the modification to the street frontage requirement, where it would allow the development to fully utilize this unique lot um, at the mid block to having access to it. The private street would provide two-way access to mitigate any egress or ingress issues, and additionally, the private street would provide adequate emergency access. The approval of the modification request is necessary for the design of the development to com be compliant with the zoning district and compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. The second consideration is the development potential, oops, sorry. Second consideration is development potential with plan development. There are three different ways that the potential owner or the owner could go about is redeveloping the project site where they demolish the existing building, but due to the zoning district, they could only build a one single family home to be compliant with the zoning district, where you'll see only one single family home in a 35,000 square feet lot. Or they can construct a public street, which typically on average ranges from 40 to 50 feet wide. And then in addition to that, they would need to provide the front yard required setback of a 20 feet from the edge of that public street. Therefore, reducing the potential buildable area of the lot. And lastly, they can alter or modify the existing structure, but since this is a non-conforming use within the structure, they are limited. They would require a special exception process, which would limit them to 25% of the gross floor area or 1,000 square feet, whichever is less. So, and the last consideration is the mitigation of the residential housing loss. The proposed development would result in two residential unit loss, but the demolition of the existing structure being a non-conforming use is exempt under the provision in Title 18. And while the proposed development does not increase the housing stock, the proposed development meets the intent of the master plan and the zoning ordinance as discussed in attachment F. Public comments were received and generally in support of it. Two comments that were received during the early notification period were in response to compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood and the potential impact of an existing fence. The applicant has addressed these concerns and lastly, there was a public comment received from East Liberty Park Community Organization. It's in your Dropbox now, but it's really to su in support of this project. So based on everything in presented to you this evening and the information in the staff report, planning staff recommends the planning commission approve the plan development and the preliminary subdivision request with the conditions listed in the staff report. This Thank you, Linda. Any questions for staff? None for staff? Okay. Um, if you would like to speak uh, during the public hearing portion of the meeting, um, if you could please fill out one of these cards and deliver it up to the, to the front here. That'll just help us organize the public hearing piece. Um, it's not required, but it, it's just helpful. 
Uh, so is the applicant here? Yes. Okay, we'll now hear from the applicant. Please state your name. My name is Philip Winston. I'm Mary Warner, I'm the architect. Um, thank you so much for the Planning Commission for hearing this tonight. Um, when the project was brought to me uh, the first time, um, I looked at the project, there were seven lots. Um, there were eight reduction and setbacks that went with those seven lots. Um, there were, the, the planning originally was set up um, to try and maximize the space and after spending some time on the project and meeting with the neighbors and deciding if we were gonna take over the project, um, the, the determination was it was too dense. And so we removed a lot out of the project. Um, the price didn't reduce, unfortunately, but we removed a lot to create more open space. We met with the neighbors to discuss their concerns, um, some of which were um, height of the residence, uh, raising of the land or the property, and the type of homes that would be built in this location. Um, other concerns um, were related to uh, uh, traffic flow, um, on-site on parking, and we, we've addressed all of those issues. We removed all of the setback requirements that were, that were originally requested from the Planning Commission and are only asking for the fact that the lot does not face a public street. Um, we asked the Planning Commission to relook at the property, which you have, and request your approval on the project. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions for the applicant? Okay. Seeing none, we'll ask you to step back and we'll go to the public hearing portion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I'd now like to open the public hearing for these items. Is there anyone here from the Community Council who would like to speak on the issue? Okay. Please come forward. You'll have five minutes. Individuals will have two minutes in which to speak. Oh. Thanks. And please state your name for the record. Hi, good evening. My name is Jason Stevenson. I'm one of the co-chairs of the East Liberty Park Community Organization, also known as ELPGO. Um, and actually live just about a, a half a block from the property as well, so I know the area pretty well. So as was mentioned in the staff report, East Liberty Park Community Organization held a special meeting on November 21st. Uh, we flyered the neighborhood to let folks know about it. Um, had a pretty good response, and as you might see in your staff report, I believe it's on page 38, there's the Q&A notes that we compiled from that meeting um, based on the questions and answers that were had. What's interesting is that this has not been the first time that we've uh, dealt with this property. And uh, it's kind of a, a tale of night and day um, in terms of what the response from our community has been from the first time back in 2017 to the response this time. And I think that goes a lot. We, we're talking about the same property, but we're talking about a very different design and a very different approach. Um, and as you can see from the notes, the community not only appreciated the outreach that had been done prior to our special meeting um, by the folks involved with this project, but also appreciated sort of the honest back and forth and the openness to taking into consideration some of their concerns, um, both prior to the meeting and during it and afterwards as well. So the East Liberty Park Community Organization, sensing the, you know, what our community feels, is in support of this project. We feel that it does add to our community. It does uh, you know, fit in with the type of housing and density that we're looking for. Um, you know, we're somewhat concerned about the loss of rental properties, especially affordable rental properties, um, and something that I think we are going to be looking at as a community council is, you know, how do we count what we lose versus what we gain, and doing a little bit more math and calculus on that for these different types of infill projects. Um, but that's something that, as was discussed, is not uh, sort of germane to the topic due to the, the non-conforming aspect of those rental properties. But it is something that we do want to look at more carefully, um, especially in, in our neighborhoods. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention as well, and I submitted a letter rather late today, I apologize for that, to Linda, um, was the sort of just follow through with many of the, uh, you know, discussions and promises that had been made about this project, including the use of the durable building materials and the outside, you know, whether or not that could be a part of the, um, I think, what is the technical term here, the uh, design review committee to approve those, um, so whether or not that can be, you know, made 
a part of the codified design covenant, sorry, trying to use my technical language here, um, as well as the design review board, whether that could be established within the, let me use the other technical term here, subdivision plat uh, for this project. Um, just to make sure that, you know, as these things move forward and take time and that we ensure that what the community was promised is what is delivered um, because we did really engage on this and a lot of people, um, uh, you know, met and talked and figured out how to make this work best. So that's the end of my presentation. And again, I'll just summarize that uh, we are in favor of this East Liberty Commons plan development. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else here? Who would like to speak on this item or these items? Judy. Judy has a short oh, sorry, Judy. It was hidden. Not really. I'm Judy Short, and I have to say that attending both the first and the second meeting with the neighborhood and the two different developers, it was like night and day to see. You know, the first one was a very hostile meeting, and the second one was like, wow, these are cool. So it was nice to see. And if you look in, in the, probably in the staff report, the price point just for the lots is quite a bit. So it's very rare to find an empty, buildable lot in that part of town. And I think it's great. Um, I was amazed when Linda said that the streets are 40 to 60 feet wide because my, I'm sure my street is maybe 30, if I'm lucky, 27. So that's pretty wide. And this is really just like having a little cul-de-sac off of 11th East. I think it'll be great. And from what we've seen, they intend to build houses that fit into the neighborhood. But again, they're going to be sold separately. So the buyer will have, I guess, the final say. So we'd like you to approve this project. Thank you, Judy. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak? Okay, please come forward and make sure to state your name for the record. Hi, uh, my name is Zachary Dusalt. Um, just going to echo with what the previous speakers had to say. Um, I think that this project should be approved. I think it's a great use of the uh, mid-block space. I am slightly concerned about the loss of the two units, but with the non-conforming nature of the plot already, this seems like the best use of that space. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, was there one more hand? Please come forward. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Brian Belknap. I live in the neighborhood, and I'm very involved with what goes on in our community. And uh, Phil has been fantastic to work with on this project. Um, it was mentioned that we had some concerns with the prior owner of the project, and uh, when they tried to ramroad that through, um, it met with a lot of resistance. Phil has been fantastic. He's been open. He's taken people out on tours. And uh, I just wanted to uh, congratulate Phil on this project. We're in favor of it. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. OK, is there anyone else who would like to speak? OK, seeing none, we will close the public hearing. Um, we can bring it back to the commission. We can bring Linda back. We can bring the applicant back. Any comments, questions from the commissioners? Yeah, Linda, I have a question about um, um, about whatever design uh, of the of the individual units. What are, what kind of controls will there be, either from our own from a planned unit development perspective, or from the developer's own perspective? Do you know? So in my staff report, I noted what the applicant was proposing in the proposed materials, but we can obviously put it as a condition, too, to kind of ensure that they're, what they have relayed to the public is what they're going to build. The applicant had, had his hand up, too. Oh, maybe once you, you oh but we can bring up. the applicant up if you'd like to answer that or address that question. Uh, 
Bill Winston again. Um, we um, are very passionate about the neighborhood. Um, we would, and don't mind if it's part of the documents, would like to build traditional style homes with a modern flair, meaning that they would be constructed of mainly brick, um, that there are some styles of homes. I have some pictures if you'd like to see some general ideas of homes we've constructed to get, kind of give the flavor and the feel. Um, the difference between the traditional style of homes that I have in my picture board, which I can grab real quick, um, is that sometimes the, to make those designs a little bit more modern, they enlarge the windows, but, but I would like the materials to stay, materials of the neighborhood, the brick and, and the, the trim and so forth to be done of the period. I guess my question is, how do you control that after you've sold a lot? We're, we're creating CCNRs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, it is an HOA. Any other questions for the applicant or staff? Any other discussion among the commissioners? I'd like to commend you for your work in engaging with the community and getting feedback and addressing comments. Um, I think it's been much appreciated. We don't often receive such positive feedback from applicants or from the community on applications before us, so we appreciate the time and effort you put into that process. Thank you so much. Would anyone like to entertain a motion? Yeah, I, I'll do it. I just want to make sure I'm doing it correct. Am I doing both of these with the same motion to approve? I think. Or do I yes, have to do them separately? Do them as oh, okay. They're combined. Well, I was reading to see if I missed something. Okay. Um, this, uh, based on the findings listed in the staff report, the information presented and input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve the plan development and preliminary subdivision requests, PLN SUB 2019-00, nope, 00904, and PLNSUB 2019-00987 as proposed, subject to complying with all applicable conditions and regulations. Okay, we have a motion by Sarah. Second. Second by John. Any discussion? None, okay. Amy. Yes. Brenda. Yes. John. Yes. Maureen. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Matt. Yes. All right. Motion passes. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is for 255 South State Street Design Review, case number PLN PCM 2019-00926. And Amy. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, this is a request by Michael Militello. I hope I said that right. He's here to correct me if I did not. Um, representing KTGY Architecture and Planning uh, for design review for additional height at approximately 255 South State Street. Uh, the proposed mixed-use project consists of two buildings, a north tower and a south tower, with a mid-block pedestrian walkway that runs through the center of the site. Um, the walkway will provide connections from State Street to Floral Street, um, as well as to the Kramer House, which is a local historic landmark site um, that they're incorporating and restoring as part of the overall project. This project's before the commission because the applicant's requesting 60 feet of additional building height um, for the North Tower. The property is located in the D1 Central Business District, and in that zone, areas um, that are mid-block can go up to a permitted height of 100 feet, and then buildings taller than that um, go through the design review process. So that's why, why the application's before you this evening. Staff is recommending approval of the project with conditions. Um, just some quick facts about the project. The North Tower is a 13-story mixed-use commercial and residential building. Uh, the 11 stories of residential include studios, one and two bedrooms, totaling 117 units. The South Tower is an eight-story, 99-foot-tall mixed-use commercial and residential building with 73 
residential units, um, including studios, one, two, three, and four bedrooms. Um, it's important to note that the north and south tower are actually connected underground with a parking garage. The south tower meets uh, the zoning requirements for the D1 zone, um, as well as all the design standards, but because those buildings are connected, we've brought the project um, in as a whole. Uh, but the focus of the staff report and the presentation tonight is on the north tower, since that's where they're requesting the additional building height. A uh, mid-block walkway is proposed um, with outdoor seating and a public gathering space through the center of the development site. Um, and again, it provides connections through the block as well as um, other nearby public spaces such as the Gallivan Center Plaza, as well as um, Edison Street and uh, the shops along there. The intent of the design review process as it relates to building height is to encourage design with an emphasis on human scale and to mitigate any negative impacts. As outlined in attachment E of the staff report, the design incorporates uh, human scaled elements such as uh, step backs, building articulation, material changes, um, transparency at the ground floor, and the massing's bro broken up into smaller components to reduce the sense of apparent height and to mitigate potential negative impacts from the proposed height. Um, buildings st step down towards lower scale buildings as well as they're stepped back um, to be more compatible with buildings such as the Kramer House and the one story buildings along Edison Street. Planning staff's uh, recommendation does include some conditions of approval. Most of those conditions um, are related to some final design details associated with landscaping, lighting, um, and some of the elements in the mid-block walkway. I did want to briefly touch on one condition of approval that we are recommending, which is to add a public entrance to the, fo the food hall commercial space along State Street um, facing the public sidewalk. The mid-block walkway is designed um, to have entrances off of that mid-block walkway, and that space is really activated which is great, um, but in staff's opinion, that without an entrance on State Street, it conflicts with the design standards related to building orientation and the purpose statement of the D1 zone and master plan policies related to um, active uses at the streetscape. Um, this is some photos of the development site. I'm sure most of us are familiar with this site as it's been um, vacant with the exception of a foundation for I don't know how many years. And then this is some photos of uh, the surrounding area, um, including the access from uh, Floral, the 200 South access where um, the parking is accessed from. And that, you can see Floral Street in that top photo on the left and then the surrounding development on Edison Street as well as the west side of State Street. Um, in terms of the public process for the project, we did send out the recognized organization notice. Um, those councils for this area are the downtown uh, central community as well as downtown alliance. Um, because the project's within a uh, certain distance from those community councils, um, a city open house was held. Uh, we had two public comments submitted. Those are um, in the staff report. And again, staff is recommending approval of the request for additional height with the conditions in the staff report. And I can answer any questions and the applicants also here. Any questions for Amy? Yeah, um, Amy, I'd like to get your comments regarding the department reviews. Mm -hmm. um, transportation commented that um, this did not meet the requirements for off-street parking? Yeah, so we've had some subsequent conversa conversations after that. Um, I think you're referring to the commercial parking or the non-residential parking requirement. Right. Um, and they could potentially meet that with some transportation demand management strategies, and they're also within a fourth of a mile of transit, which would allow them a 50% reduction of their parking. Um, so at the time those comments were submitted, we, we weren't sure of the reductions that they would be applying for, um, but it appears that they would meet at least the transit um, within the proximity to transit. Uh, so they could actually reduce their parking by 50% um, of what, what they have now. So. Okay. 
Amy, I have a question about the design review that you did as planning staff, and you said that the um, impact was to encourage design with an emphasis on human scale and mitigate any negative impacts and further, um, um, so some of those things were building massing is broken up uh, and uh, things like that. Um, how much of that is written design regulation as part of the downtown or zone or where is, where is that coming from? So some of those standards are specifically in the design review in attachment E, I believe. Um, and I've, I've noted where those standards of approval relate to each specific standard. I believe it's standard B. Um, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of asking in relationship to the, I, I look at this facade and I see a jumble. So I'm wondering whether that's something that is, is our fault uh, as a, as as part of our guidelines, is that is that is, are we causing this project to look, um, you know, like five different materials and you know eight different window types and things like that? Is that is that something that we're that we are doing, or you're doing, or the design guidelines are having that effect? I mean, it's not a. Not what, not what I would call a classical design. It's a very, it's a very jumbled up design. A lot of, lot of broken up stuff. And I've noticed it in more than one project that we've brought forward. That's why I'm asking this question. It's really not directed specifically at this project. So, so let me be clear about that. Yeah, I mean, if you look in attachment E, you can see some of the, um, where the standards are broken down into like maximizing transparency. Um, it talks about the solids to voids of windows and doors. Yeah, but um, that's not what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing a lot of in and out and back and forth and big changes of materials from the middle to the middle, middle to the base, you know, to one side to another. Um, you know, <clears throat> Commissioner, strange materials and stuff like that. I, I think uh, what you're kind of getting at are like the base design standards for the D1 zone. And yes. in the D1 zone, you would be shocked at how few there are. It's basically glass uh, setbacks and height. Um, that's actually, hopefully, if we could keep our planners um, and get fully staffed, uh, it is definitely on the, a priority list um, to help implement the downtown restaurant is to add additional design um, standards. Some of the things that, of course, the design review talks about are more general, like you were speaking to, but there aren't any standards specifically saying you must articulate the building at this point or this point or this point. Um, we will look at those in the future. So this, this, these were choices from the architect. So this so. vertical breakup of the facade, and it just kind of like that, that was just a choice a, from that's the That's an architectural team. choice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. Thank you both. Okay, any other questions for Amy? All right, is the, the applicant is here? Okay, we'll hear from the applicant. Good evening, uh, Michael Militello. I'm the architect um, for the project in question. And I um, just want to thank Amy really quickly. Um, you've been really supportive and really helpful throughout this whole process. So great presentation as well. Um, I just had a few slides, extra slides, to quickly kind of go over. And I think it kind of addresses some of the comments that have already been brought up as well. So um, if you bear with me, I'll just go through these really quickly. Um, Try to get a full screen here. Thank you. Um, so as Amy stated in her presentation, the intent of the D1 zone standards and the mid-block walkway guidelines was to allow for much needed high density housing projects within the downtown area that also enhance the walkability and pedestrian experience and ensure that the building's design positively, positively adds to an exciting downtown skyline. 
I think our design does both, and our team has strived to do that from the very beginning, so I just wanted to show you quickly a bit about the process that we took to get to the current design. Um, though the mid-block standard for our site initially limits the height to 100 feet, we felt our specific site was an ideal location for a high-rise tower that could complement the exciting or the existing skyline in the immediate vicinity. As you will note, our, par our parcel is sandwiched between the Broadway Center Tower to the south and the Parkside Tower to the north, uh, both are, which are reaching almost 200 feet in height. Each has, also has a shorter podium element to them that helps infill the space with a more pedestrian scale mass. Um, we wanted to replicate those same moves but respond to the specific constraints on our site as well. Uh, we decided the required mid-block walkway should be in the form of a pedestrian paseo that would bisect our project creating two towers on either side. Then we played with the balance of the program and density and you can see how we carved out certain areas and positioned certain elements to achieve a certain quality of space. We figured the shorter tower would be ideal on the south side so as not to block as much solar exposure from the other building in Paseo. And the northern tower's placement is ideal in terms of looking at the rhythm and spacing of the tall towers along the block. When you look down State Street, you'll feel these three towers at almost the same height framing your view down the street towards the Capitol building. As for the massing of the building themselves, we didn't want a simple extruded box. We wanted to introduce a unique form to the skyline that could help shape future projects. The lower podium building actually follows the geometry of the diagonal paseo, but the towers themselves then reorient themselves to be perpendicular to the street grid. This allows for a variation in massing and brings enough interest for the eyes. We also wanted to create some different variation in the in articulation of the facades and did this by creating some ins and outs or slots in the floor plans where maybe balcony or bathrooms are located that run up the building vertically and help to separate the different facade patterns. We came up with three different types of patterns, a simple corrugated metal siding with a punched window, an angled brie soleil that responds to the path of the sun, and a sleek larger window wall element that accents the corners along State Street. These three patterns vary and overlap in a few spaces. Up on the screen, this is the angled Brie Soleil design on a portion of this facade which will help to regulate solar exposure for the living and bedroom areas in these units. The deep recessed windows and the shadows created by the angles help give it a very dynamic look that will change depending on the time of day and the seasons. The horizontal ledges that are created every other floor help to break up the height and make the facade not seem too monumental or monotonous. This is a view kind of looking down on the Paseo in between those two Brisole areas. This is a detail of the special window wall corner element on each tower that are highly visible from State Street. The effect is a sleek contemporary look with a smooth combination of metal panel and slightly inset windows. We thought this contrasted nicely with the deep ins and outs of the angled Brisole, giving the eye a nice variety of movement, lighting, and texture. Again, the white horizontal banding here aligns with those found on the Brie Soleil and are used as a visual element to help break down the massing and act as a trigger to change the stagger of the window and metal panel patterning. In conclusion, we think the uniqueness of the site really lends itself to wanting to be a tall high-rise building that makes an impact on the city's downtown skyline. The different moves in massing and facade detailing lend themselves well to a tall building because they help to break down what would otherwise be a very monotonous tall project. And that's about it. Hey, any questions for the applicant? Are you okay with the conditions in the staff report concerning the additional entrance off of State Street and the Yeah. Other? Yeah, we are. Um, I think what our reasoning behind it was to pull everyone into the Paseo as much as possible and then have the entrances into the ground floor food hall um, be there, but we agree that there could be, there should be an entrance, uh, you know, doors off State Street as well. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, does, has anybody filled out a card already? <laughs> you want to just bring your cards up here and then I'll just, then we'll go to the public hearing portion. Thank you. Okay, we'll now open the public hearing. Is there anybody here from the Community Council 
or one of the three community councils or organizations that'd like to speak. Okay, seeing none, um, Scott Sabi, if you'd like to come up, you'll have two minutes. Thank you, my name is Scott Sabi, and I'd like to speak uh, against the granting of this increase. Uh, a city goes through a significant amount of effort in its zoning in determining what works for utilities, traffic, all of the other things. Charrettes bring in experts and they set zoning requirements and in this case a particular mid-block height restriction of 100 feet for a reason. Uh, I've not heard any reason to increase this by 60%. And it's not just a measure of what's financially viable for the project. There, there needs to be more to overcome all of the work and the reasoning that went in to setting the height limits that were already there. Uh, as we're all aware, parking downtown is already at a, a substantial shortage and a struggle. Uh, I, this project does not meet current you start talking about a TOD or, or their ability to reduce it further, uh, we're all familiar with what happened in the news with Sugar House with the substantial reduction there as a, as a uh, TOD and the people that are now parking in driveways and all over and saying, I just, there's nowhere I can park. I'm three, four blocks from my house. I, I didn't realize it was going to be that kind of problem. We already have a problem parking downtown uh, and I think this fails to meet it and saying, well, as a TOD or they can do a further reduction, ignores the problem of parking. Uh, I have a problem with the access to this, which is on Flower Street, a street that's an old, essentially an alley in the old 660 foot blocks, which is now the primary road. It's not wide enough to qualify as a minor collector or even as a, as a local road, it's too small and between residences and businesses and access for, for uh, deliveries, et cetera, you're talking accumulatively about 200 units that are going to be using this alley as their primary entrance and exit. On the south end, exiting onto the walkway, the pedestrian diagonal walkway that accesses the Heber Wells building. Uh, I, I don't think it can meet it. There's clearly no lights there. Uh, to, to control so it. If you'd like to wrap up, your two minutes okay. expired. I, two other points. I'll be real quick. Very um, quick. One, I don't think it's compatible in height, and it hurts the local businesses that are there, the one-level restaurants and, and those sorts of things. Uh, and I think it makes the area unfriendly and unusable. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Zachary Dussault. My name is Zachary Dussault. Um, I just want to start off with saying the exact opposite about parking that the other gentleman just said. I'm sorry about that. But uh, if there's anywhere in the city that is more walkable or more trans trans accessible, it's this site. There and right now the um, minimum requirements for parking is the 95 units. Hopefully, once this um, parking revision is passed by the city council, which we're hoping for any week now the requirement will be zero units of parking for this, um, for this project. And I don't know what phase the design process is right now, but I would love to see that because this is um, a very pedestrian-oriented development and uh, would bring much needed density to the area. And I, I honestly think the design is great. I think it's, it's made for pedestrians. It's, it's got a food hall in the center. Uh, I'm a little concerned because State Street isn't exactly the most pedestrian fr friendly street in the city, but uh, you kind of got to work with what you got. But I'm very excited about this project. I hope you guys consider approving it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, State your name for the record and you'll have two minutes. My name is David Morell. I own a building on Edison Street. Have had it uh, for 30 years. Had a wonderful experience with RDA helping rehab it. And I agree with, uh, sorry, Matt? Your name? Yeah. Zach. Zach. I completely agree with Zach. 
Um, I think it's an incredible development. I love the design, and I can speak for other people on Edison Street. They're all in favor. We want to fill that hole. Um, you all, you guys know what, what has happened in the past. I've seen it firsthand. Um, the other thing I'd like to say in closing is that I've, uh, I'm friends, or not friends, but I know the uh, project manager, um, Whitney. You know, you know Whitney. Um, she's been wonderful addressing any questions I've had, and so that's it. I mean, just you guys need to prove this. It's a wonderful project. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anybody else here who would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, we will close the public hearing. We can bring it back up to the staff to discuss. We can bring Amy up. Okay. Any follow-up questions for Amy? I have some questions. Um, is so I guess I didn't understand or please where where do people drive in and out of this of the parking on this building? It is on Floral Street because that just says loading zone right now. Am I so? What am I missing? So Floral Street is accessed from 200 South. Um, I have this photo pulled up in the top left corner. That's the access um, from 200 South looking down at Floral Street. And then um, there's another view on the bottom left that's at the subject property looking out along Floral Street to 2nd South. So it will be all of the, all of the traffic will be on that street in and out? Um, they do also have a private alley, um, and that's shown in the left middle. Um, and I believe, I'm not exactly sure what that area is for, if it's just for loading of commercial goods, but in terms of the vehicular um, parking access for the underground garage, yeah. I believe that's all off of Floral Street, and then they do have their loading areas um, off of Floral okay. Street as well. And it's wide enough. I've walked it, but I thought it was just a private drive. I've, it's wide enough for two directions? I'm not positive if it's wide enough for two directions. I think in their um, site plan, you can see their circulation, how they plan to do the site. It looks like they plan to, like when a truck pulls into the loading area, they would back up and then go out forward. Um, I'm not certain how wide that street is. I believe it used to be a public street and it was vacated, so now it's just a private right of way. Okay. Could we? The transportation department reviewed that component of the plan yet? Yeah, I did um, route this to transportation and their comments are um, included in the department comments. I asked them specifically about this access area and they, they didn't have any um, have specific concerns. comments about it. Um, that's not to say that they might not have other comments when they get to the building permit phase of the proposal. In the plan, it looks like it's 14 feet wide. Thank you. That's pretty narrow. I'd, I'd, I'd have some questions for the developer sure. at some point. Um, <laughs> we'd like the applicant to come back. So I'm super excited about this project. I want to, so I have a few questions. That there is an alley on the um, east, southeast, that I don't know if it's connected to you or not. It looks like there might even be a wall up there. I know the alley exists right now. Mm -hmm. Does that tie in to your project, or is there a wall, something that's holding, that, that cuts us off from that? No, there's no wall. There's no physical wall. So I could take my scooter across and get to Edison through that space. Yeah, through on that little private. Uh, okay, uh, basically. I just want to make sure it's all a single level. Right now, yeah. I think, are you referring to this middle picture on yeah, the, the middle left? left picture? Yeah, so they the do have some cement plans. barricades, and I think that's because right now, if you wanted to ride your scooter down that alley, you would fall into a giant hole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's supposed to open up and connect it all. Okay, that's what I'm clarifying. Yeah. Good, that, made, that I'm glad. Um, and the same on the north side of Kramer, there's that surface parking lot. It's all a single level again, so it's, it's connecting everything together on that block. Okay, Correct. thank you. It's all That's, level. And what was the logic to not have any parking coming off of State Street where you can turn off and 
I mean, here, the, or, the, or coming up the alley, or coming know, up the alley, or it's wider. And so we, uh, the idea is that the all the traffic is coming off of Floral Street, the that alley, in and out of the project, um, into the parking behind. Um, we didn't want a curb cut off State Street because we thought that it would ruin the frontage, uh, would ruin the pedestrian experience up and down the street. Um, and I'm not sure if transportation looked at that, but uh, we didn't receive any comments from them about that either. But why come down floral instead of go through that alley behind that parking garage? It seems to be, I mean, it's 41 feet wide and it seems like it provides more access into the property. Um, was a floral that's 14 feet wide and kind of wraps down and around. I think because right now that floral street um, has better circulation. As there's actually a, there's a lot of shared parking lots in that area where people are going up and down that alley right now. Whereas the um, the smaller alley, even though it's a little wider, it's actually um, there's a lot of trees and other sort of infrastructural pieces that are kind of in that area that aren't very um, conducive to actual circulate, like driving vehicular circulation. I'm, I mean, is there any way you could tie both in? I, I live a block from here, and we have four entrances into our parking garage, and we're always grateful because something's under construction over here or something's shut down over there, and we, uh, we have other access. If you have just one tiny little road, I'm worried about that for this building. So is there a way that you can tie Floral Street in and then this unnamed alley so that there are two access points in and out? We, we could look into it. Um, one of the things we didn't want to do was to, as soon as you start to do that, you kind of um, you conflict with the in front of the Kramer house. We kind of wanted to connect that whole uh, paseo, you know, pedestrian wise from State Street all the way to the Kramer house and not have it um, intersected with anything. So as soon as you sort of tie the vehicular circulation between Floral Street and that other alley, you have cars kind of coming up and down that. Which I don't want. I'm wanting you to take alley and drop it down, have that drop down into your parking garage. Oh, introduce it as a second. Right. A second, a second. I think yes. you're going to, I can't believe par, uh, the parking or transportation didn't talk to you about that. I don't understand why that's not in our code. It's living in a building like this. There's no way we could get along with one entrance. And so, yes, I'm, is there a way to give yourselves a second entrance? We looked at that too. Um, we also have um, a commercial tenant that we're trying to introduce into the bottom ground floor of that south tower as well. That actually wraps around the back, and it's related to the film society that actually um, inhabits the Broadway Center. So they wanted us, we kind of agree that they wanted to also have sort of a pedestrian environment as well. And as, as soon as you start to introduce some parking access and drives there, it also ruins it. So. We're trying to do as much as we can to sort of like create, you know, help protect this sort of pedestrian movement and everything through here. We wanted to emphasize a pedestrian friendly environment I as much as that. possible. Yeah. We wanted to try to do as much as we could to keep parking limited, but still obviously, you know, meet the requirements. Um, but like everyone, a couple people have said, this is really just the perfect spot being a block away from the Gallivan Center train station where you really want people to be coming in and out um, and, and not limit their access by having entrances and ramps everywhere. But yeah, we, I understand what you're saying and I know there's um, parking is definitely going to be a challenge. Okay. My, my comment would be to defend the alley because I think connecting the two blocks for pedestrians is really important uh, from my perspective. I think this project is what we need more of in our downtown where we've got dense, we increase density to a decrease traffic. Um, I think that's great. I think it's unfortunate having a smaller street to get in and out, but maybe that will promote more pedestrian use. Um, but for me, protecting the people and creating a space for 
not just the people that live in the building, but for the neighborhood and the surrounding. I think that alley actually brings more people into the space. But there's a, there's that walkway where the trees are. You can That's where the pedestrians are going to be. This other is four cars. Why not use the cars to give it a space? I mean, I'm very selfishly looking at this. I use this block every day. So I know what this could be and how I would use it. And I'm telling you what cars will want, what pedestrians will want from personal experience. So I'm, I feel strongly about that, but if we don't have, you know, if it's not in code, we can't really force it. But I'd strongly encourage you. Um, Commissioner, one thing we might want to keep in mind, it does appear that it's probably a private alley and not a public alley. Um, so a private alley doesn't necessarily mean that everybody who touches it has access to it. So I'm not sure if um, whether the RDA or the applicants have actually looked into the ownership. They may have access to it, but um, it, I would be careful if we were going to make any conditions upon it that we would make sure that is an alley that they do actually have a right to utilize. And is Floral Street, does it, is that a city street? It is also a private street. It's a private street. It was a city street, but they do have access to Floral Street. So who will, re who will be responsible for maintaining that? The same people that are maintaining it now. I believe it's just it's whoever the property yeah, owners. it's whoever's the property owners adjacent. Okay, to it. and they're and but we're increasing a ton. We're adding a ton of cars to it, and they're. But if they have an good. easement right, and okay, that's outside of our purview. Okay, any other questions or discussion? I, I do want to uh, commend you on the um, massing and the height. For me, it's very important that we begin to have a taller downtown. And so I'm not um, at all troubled by the height of this building. And I think it's clearly related to the other buildings surrounding it and across the street. I also really uh, appreciate the design of the pedestrian um, pedestrian space in the middle, and I think that all have been handled very, very well. Um, I will say, though, as I indicated earlier, that I am a little disturbed by the fact that there are no less than three, maybe even four, can't really count yet, uh, different... Uh, um, um, design typologies on the facade of this one building, of this one set of buildings, so that you get, uh, for me, what is a very um, unfortunate uh, jumbled look to it. And I know that that's uh, not part of our purview to design, but I'm just sort of setting a warning shot off, I guess, by saying this. But I really think that, um, in particular, uh, the color change bothers me quite a bit on the vertical side here. And um, so that it really takes what could be a very elegantly masked building and adds um, not only just the massing part of it, but also the facade, um, the fenestration, and so forth into the mix and makes it even more um, frenetic um, as a building than it needs to be, which I don't think we um, see in our downtown. I don't think we need in our downtown either. So I know that this is not part of a design review that we can that we have a guideline surrounding. So I don't believe that we can make... Uh, changes required for it, but I do think that this is something that, as a commission, we ought to take into consideration, and I'd like the planning staff to look over to make sure that when we do a VV projects like this, they don't, this, I've seen something similar to this on another project that we've had here, too, so. Okay, any other comments, questions? Is anybody willing to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Yep. Uh, based on the analysis and findings in the staff report, information presented and the input received in the public hearing, I move the Planning Commission approve design review request for additional height PLN SUB 2019-926 with the project located approximately 255 South and State Street. Uh, this recommendation is based on the conditions listed below and in the staff report. Uh, final uh, details regarding these conditions of approval are delegated to planning staff. We have a motion by Matt. I'll second. Second by Maureen. Any additional discussion? Okay. Uh, Matt. Yes. 
Sarah. Yep. Maureen. Yes. John. Yes. Brenda. No. Amy. Yes. Okay. Uh, six, four, one against. Motion passes. Thank you very much for your application. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the Rosewood Park Street Closure and Alley Vacation, which has two case numbers, case number PLN PCM 2019-01036 and PLN PCM 2019-01037. And Christopher will give the staff report. Good evening, Planning Commission. Um, <clears throat> these items before you tonight are a request from Olga Crump of the Real Estate Services Department. Um, she is, um, she applied or er, submitted the applications on behalf of the Parks Department and the Trails and uh, Natural Lands Department. Um, they are seeking street closure and alley vacation within Rosewood Park in order to cons er, excuse me, in order to consolidate the property to simplify the permitting process for future um, improvement projects. Um, <clears throat> Rosewood Park is located at approximately 1400 north and 1200 west in the Rose Park area of Salt Lake City. Uh, the park is located between 1200 west and I-15 and encompasses approximately um, 28 acres, uh, which is mostly grass, um, is primarily used as soccer fields, but does have amenities such as baseball and softball fields, um, a playground, tennis courts, a dog park, and a skate park. Um, <clears throat> the proposed street closure and alley vacations involve six unimproved streets and five unimproved alleys within Rosewood Park. The park was built over a section of the Kinney and Gorley's improved subdivision plat. The sub subdivision was platted in 1887, but never developed as intended. Uh, development in the area did not follow the street pattern uh, the plat created, leaving the dedicated streets and alleys within Rosewood Park disconnected from a road network system. Um, the streets and alleys within the park exist only on paper. Um, they were never constructed as, as intended and do not physically exist. Um, there will be no physical modifications made to Rosewood Park as part of these applications. Uh, the request is to remove these alleys and streets from the plat in order to consolidate the parcels and form one parcel to make it easier to obtain building permits for future improvement projects. Uh, the reason these processes are needed is because when construction occurs on any property in Salt Lake City, a building permit is required. Uh, building permits are issued based on the parcel in which the construction will occur. Um, if construction will occur on multiple parcels, a building permit would be required for each individual parcel um, and zoning regulations would apply to each parcel individually. Um, it was common practice for the city to construct parks or other public facilities over multiple parcels and right of ways when the city owned all of the land within the development. Uh, because, of a, <clears throat> because a separate permit must be pulled for each parcel, this often would create problems when trying to meet zoning requirements, such as setbacks or lot coverage for each of the separate parcels within the development. Building within public right-of-ways um, could often present challenges as well since permission would be required from Salt Lake Engineering or Real Estate, um, or Real Estate Services Department in order to build on top of those right-of-ways. Uh, with a large number of parcels that exist in Rosewood Park, an improvement project could require multiple permits. Tracking multiple permits through the permitting process as well as the um, inspection processes after the permits um, have been issued um, can be a pretty daunting task. Um, one that um, could be streamlined if only one permit was required. If Rosewood Park were to be consolidated into one singular, singular parcel, it would greatly increase the efficiency of obtaining and tracking building permits as well as meeting the standards for zoning requirements. Uh, this is crucial to meet uh, the goals set forth by the Northwest Master Plan as well as the Rose Park Small Area Plan, uh, which emphasizes the importance of recreational facilities 
and the ability to maintain and improve and improve the facilities to match city growth. Um, this is just a depiction. Um, if you can see, you can see all of the tiny little parcels that exist within the park. So if they wanted to do any kind of improvement to any of those and it encompassed, you know, five or six or 10 different parcels, a permit would have to be pulled for every one of those parcels. Um, <clears throat> Um, this is just kind of a depiction of the streets and alleys that will be uh, removed from the plat. Um, you can see there's quite a few of them in there. Um, this is actually the Kinney and Gourley's uh, plat from 1887. Um, you can see um, how the, all of the parcels were originally platted. Um, the little pop-out shows where the park is located now. So you can see even now those parcels have changed since what has been platted. There have been um, some streets in there that have been vacated already. Um, these applications would essentially further that and take all of those streets and remove them. Um, <clears throat> these here are just some site photos of the park. And then these show some of the amenities that exist in the park. Um, as far as public process, um, notice um, was sent to the Rose Park and Capitol Hill Community Councils. Um, early public notice was sent to the property owners and planning staff also held an open house to gather public comment. Um, notice of a public hearing, or this public hearing was also sent out. Uh, there was one comment that was received, uh, mostly in support. Uh, when the original notices went out, a lot of the community was a little upset, uh, but mostly that was because they thought roads and streets or something, something was happening to the park. Um, they didn't want the park to change, they wanted it to stay the same. Um, we had a pretty good turnout at the open house where it was explained to them that there, you're going to see no change to the park itself. This is all merely an on-paper thing. Um, and in fact, these applications would actually help to make it so that nothing gets developed there because it is an open space. By removing those parcels and making it one singular parcel, that's actually going to make it harder to do any kind of development on there because you'd have to replat that whole area in order to put parcels and streets and things in there. Um, <clears throat> So because of that, um, staff recommends that the Planning Commission forward a favorable recommendation to the City Council uh, with the condition that the closed streets and alleys um, as well as the remaining parcels will be consolidated into one singular parcel. And that's all that I have. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions for Chris? No. Is anyone from Real Estate Services here to speak um, or...? They are not. They um, had planned to attend, but then had an emergency that they weren't able to make it. So okay. no um, I did speak with them beforehand, um, and they felt that everything was pretty straightforward. And so, okay, we'll then move on to the public hearing portion. Um, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anybody here who would like to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Um, bring it back to staff. Madam Chair, I'm ready to make a motion. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm normally not in favor of alley vacations, but this one I can get behind easily enough. Based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, the policy considerations for street closure and alley vacation, and the input received, I move that the Planning Commission forward a positive recommendation to the City Council for the street closure and alley vacation proposed in PLN PCM 2019-01036 and PLN PCM 2019-01037 with the condition listed in the staff report. Okay, we've got a motion by Amy. Second. Second by Matt. We'll go down. We'll start with Amy. Yes. Brenda. Yes. John. Yes. Maureen. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Matt. Yes. Okay, motion passes, and then this will be heard by the City Council for a final decision. Great, thank you very much.
And you may see a few more of these. So I think Real Estate Services has a, a few sites like this where we were lazy in the past decades and didn't close our alleys and streets when we should have. So. Well, alrighty then. So get ready. We look forward to that. Right. Okay, the next item on the, on the agenda is the Axioms Townhomes, and there are three case numbers. We've got PLN, PCN, 2019-00953, PLN, SUB, 2019-00954, and PLN, SUB, 2019-00995. And Daniel is here to present the staff report. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is a request for approval of a 10-lot townhome development at 905 West Euclid Avenue, which is 140 South, approximately. Um, the applicant is seeking approval through three different processes. This includes a plan development request um, for some zoning modifications involving lot frontage on public street requirements for lots. Um, and they're also asking for a modification to an alley use limitation for parking. As far as design review modifications, they're also asking for some uh, modifications to the stucco limitations and a modification to the entry feature requirement. Um, this proposal also includes a subdivision um, plat request um, that's normally handled administratively by staff, but since um, the plan development involve lot, involves lots, uh, we included it with the plan development request. So again, this is a 10-lot townhome development. Um, it is located in the TSA Urban Neighborhood Transition Zone. Um, that zone allows for development up to 50 feet in height, has limited setbacks, very few setbacks, um, and uh, limited uh, parking requirements. Um, it's one parking stall uh, per dwelling unit. Um, so this is the elevation or rendering of the development and a site plan of the development. The two homes closest to Euclid Avenue um, have their entrances on the street, have their windows facing Euclid Avenue. Um, the remaining eight units that are behind those front two um, are accessed by a center running mid-block walkway, um, walkway through the middle of the site um, that also goes back all the way to an open space in the back um, where they also have allocated their parking. Um, so their parking will be accessed purely from the alley. There's no curb cuts on the Euclid. They're actually removing a curb cut from Euclid. Um, and they're providing one stall uh, per uh, townhome, which meets the zoning requirement. So as far as plan development request, um, they are requesting lots without street frontage. Eight of the ten lots um, won't have street frontage. Um, this could be developed without this process as apartments or condominium units. Um, but lots are easier to obtain uh, FHA, Federal Housing Administration financing, which has lower down payments. So we often get um, requests from developers to do uh, to break developments up by lots rather than condominiums. Um, overall, if with lower down payments, it helps meet city housing goals to increase affordability, um, broadens the range of incomes um, that housing is available for. Um, so we recommend approval of that modification. Uh, they are also asking to use the alley uh, to back up their vehicles for their parking. Um, this is normally allowed for up to five stalls, um, but the way the parking code currently reads um, would apply to any public right-of-way, which includes alleys. Um, and generally, this five-stall limitation is intended to um, reduce the impact on traffic on streets um, or potential collision points between vehicles, um, but alleys are much slower speed right-of-ways without those same concerns. Um, and in fact, the new parking chapter um, that just came before the Planning Commission has eliminated that limitation, um, so people could use alleys um, without that five-stall limit. Um, overall, we believe this re results in a more efficient um, use of the property, less pavement, fewer curb cuts, and fewer pedestrian conflict points. So we also recommend approval of that uh, modification to let them use the alley for up to 10 stalls. Uh, they are also asking for approval through the design review process. Um, this is partially uh, because they didn't obtain enough TSA points um, for staff level approval. So this is in a TSA zone. For a TSA development, um, you first go through a scoring point score system, um, and you get points for things like uh, meeting certain density goals, um, going above uh, the zoning requirements for durable materials on your front facade. Um, in this case, it didn't um, quite get enough points. Um, 
So they just proceeded through the design review process, which is the alternative to the point scoring system. You're not required to go through the point scoring system, um, and you're not penalized by just going through this design review process. Uh, the point of the point scoring system is to encourage people to uh, meet those points. Um, the alternative being you have to go through a public process. Um, but in this case, we're already going through a plan development process, um, so they've also applied for design review. Um, the one benefit for developers through this process is that you can ask for design standard modifications um, through the design review process, but those modifications still need to meet the intent um, of what that design standard is. And the design standards, again, are um, things like windows, uh, material requirements, entry requirements. Um, so in this case, the developer is asking for a minor modification to allow for stucco use on their facade. Um, in the TSA zone, you're allowed no stucco on the ground floor and up to 10% on the upper floors. Um, in this case, they are uh, at 5% on the ground floor and 21% on the upper floors. Um, this does exceed the limits, um, but the stucco is generally limited to the architectural feature um, that breaks up the materials on the front facade and the roof element that's set back from the, the primary front facade. Um, generally, I think this is minimal. It adds visual interest, adds a contrasting material uh, to the brick and the fiber cement board. Um, and so we recommend approval of that modification. It still meets the intent um, of the stucco limitations. And when we imposed the stucco limitations in this TSA zone, um, that was generally in response to large buildings where a small percentage allowance of stucco um, can end up with large areas of blank, um, uninteresting uh, facade. So in this case, it, this, the stucco usage generally adds something um, to the front facade. So we would recommend approval of that modification. Uh, the other uh, modification they're requesting um, has to do um, with their entry feature requirement. In the TSA zone, um, there's four different, you have to have an entry feature on a front facade next to a public street. Um, and there's four different options that are very specific. Um, and they require a five foot covered depth. Um, that could be a canopy or an inset entrance um, or a pat uh, porch. Um, in this case, they're not quite meeting that five foot depth. They're at a three foot covered depth, um, but they also have a two foot uncovered, uh, two foot or so uncovered area in front of that um, covered area. Um, overall, their usable patio area exceeds the minimum area dimensions and exceeds the minimum five foot depth requirement for those spaces. Um, additionally, the fence projecting beyond the front facade calls additional attention to that entry versus the alternative, which would be they could just simply push that green portion of the facade back two feet um, to simply just meet the standard. Um, generally, it meets the intent, provide a visually interesting entry feature, and provides a street presence with an alternative design, um, despite not quite meeting those specific numbers. Overall, uh, the plan development um, generally has to do with modifications resulting in a better product. Um, we believe that the modifications do result in a better product. Uh, it also complies with the master plan expectations for the area, um, which is just a transition zone, and transitioning to a more urban um, neighborhood. Additionally, it meets the general design standards would have to do um, with materials, articulation of the facade, providing um, transparency to provide sufficient pedestrian interest and the modifications still meet the intent of those design standards. Um, so we are recommending approval with the conditions on the uh, front page of the staff report. Um, those generally have to do with the uh, technical requirements of the subdivision, um, including uh, establishing an HOA um, to maintain any of the shared infrastructure, walkways, parking that they're going to have. Um, and we did receive one public comment from a neighbor, um, and that public comment was in support of the proposal. So with that, that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Questions for Daniel. Daniel, can you go over the uh, the front facade thing again? Uh huh. Because uh, I was looking through all of the drawings, and it may be in there. But uh, so from the fence to the inset, what is that depth? Five feet nine, and the minimum requirement would be. That's so five nine, right there. Right there. Okay, that's that was really my question. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for Daniel? Is the applicant here? Yes. Okay. Good 
Good evening. My name is Jared Hall. I am the architect on the project and also part of the ownership team. So we're, the axioms, sort of the name came from like, it's the statement that you have to agree to as true before you can sort of make arguments about other things. And we're, we're really excited about the Euclid neighborhood. I live on the west side. It's, there's so many cool things coming there. The Folsom Trail is going to be less than a block from this project. There's new bars and restaurants coming. We're just super excited for this and for our project to be on the leading edge of what's going to be a transform, transformation over the next few years for this neighborhood. So when I moved to Salt Lake, it was about 10 years ago, and at that time, and it's only gotten worse, like when you're looking for a house at an entry level, you get an old broken down house in Salt Lake, which even now is not affordable, or you move way out to Harriman, which sounds like hell. Um, and so <laughs> it, it's as sort of part of my profession, it became this goal to develop housing that gives an option for people to stay in the city, but at an affordable level. And so that's where we're sort of going here. And one thing to do that, we're, we're Euclid neighborhood is one of the few neighborhoods where you could afford, or houses are still around $300,000 for kind of a base level house. And we're doing our best to make sure this project meets that price point so that we're densifying the neighborhood, but we're not gentrifying the neighborhood. We're just providing more housing at the same basic level as already there. So to do that, one of the things, as Daniel mentioned, is we're asking for lots without frontage. And as I'm sure you've seen many, many times, that's sort of one of the best tools we have in Salt Lake for developing infill projects in our giant blocks that can provide some sort of density. And as Daniel mentioned, de developing that way provides a lot more financing options for end buyers that particularly at a lower price point are generally the only type of mortgages they can get. So we're asking for that. Um, so on our stucco modification, we are asking for the stucco to continue on the ground level. As Daniel mentioned, it's only 10% and we feel that's appropriate. It, it keeps with a sort of simple basic geometries and this repetition you can kind of see down our internal alley of these use that wrap around the building. And so we want that to continue to the ground. The stucco modification on the upper floor is actually only for the roof deck level, not the main facade level. And we feel with that being set back from the street and then having a tree canopy that will grow in eventually, it will be mostly hidden from public view anyway. So on we're, as Daniel mentioned, we're putting, putting the parking off the alley. We feel with the amount of traffic on that alley, like we've spent quite a bit of time over there and we've seen one instance of a human in the alley. There was someone setting cats or traps to catch feral cats. Um, so it's not used at all. We're excited to get some cars back there, get some eyes on the street to prevent any potential problems. And Putting the parking back there off the alley also eliminates a curb cut and a potential pedestrian and vehicular uh, interface. Um, we also like using carports. We've done another development like this where we use carports sort of set away so that you have to get out of your car and walk to your front door to provide even more opportunities just to interact with your neighbors. Like I, I live in a place where I park on the street and that's 90% of the way I see my neighbors. If I parked in a garage, I would never see anyone. So we're, we're sort of like detaching the parking from the actual living unit. Um, so interaction with the sidewalk, like as I said, I live here, I run, I've spent thousands of miles on Salt Lake City streets and keeping this pedestrian experience really strong is important to me. So we're actually providing one more tree in the park strip than it would be required per zoning. Um, and we are, have worked back and forth with, with Daniel a fair amount to try and get this uh, street wall that it, the zone is sort of designed for with our building facade, but also keep it close enough, but push it back a little bit so that the interaction between this porch and the pedestrian is really good. Like it's a big enough porch, you can sit there with your coffee in the morning and say hi to someone without like yelling and saying hi to someone that's 40 feet away. Um, we are asking to have a small portion uncovered and feel that's Generally, porches are covered for shade, and in this case, it's on the north facade of the building, so it will be shade virtually all the time. Um, and 
from my experience in the city, even covered porches aren't used much when it's raining or snowing out. Um, so as Daniel mentioned, we have 10 units per acre, which gives us a density of 35 units per acre. The goal in the master, uh, North Temple Master Plan is between 30 and 40. So we feel we're really hitting that. It, I've had the opportunity to go to Philadelphia a lot over the last year or two, and that a lot of the sort of periphery of downtown is right around that 35 units per acre. And I feel like that density just like is so awesome and something we're totally missing in Salt Lake. We have sort of eight units per acre single family houses and we're starting to get a lot of hundred plus units per acre in denser developments, but nowhere do we have a consistent 35-ish where you start to get good neighborhood retail that can actually survive. And so we're happy to start doing that. One of the issues that always comes with density is open space. And so every one of these units has a private uh, roof deck that they'll each have their own sort of open space along with a really small backyard where their mechanical equipment would sit. Um, we did, in talking to the neighbors, there was one person say something about like there wasn't a, a amenity space on the project. And we're like, yeah, but living downtown is the amenity. You have Fultzum Trail a block away that we would rather the residents go there and provide life into the truly public spaces that are really great and really close rather than provide some sort of private open space that would be just for our residents. And that is the end of my presentation, so I'll take your questions. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, can you confirm the distance between the buildings in the middle? It's 11 feet. Because the, because the, does that mean that there's a, an extra foot somewhere that's, that's uh, part of somebody's property line? Because so, because the side plan shows 10 feet between. Yeah, there's actually six inches on each side and then the 10 foot public way in the middle. Okay. And do the doors then face each other right across from mm -hmm. each other? They do. Okay. And the windows face right across from each other, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, we will now open the public hearing. Is there anybody here who would like to speak on this application? Okay, sir, please come forward and state your name for the record. Oh, I forgot to ask. Is there anyone from the community council here to speak? There's not, okay. You'll have two minutes. Hi. My name is Michael Fife. I live at 974 Euclid Avenue. Um, I just wanted to speak in generally in support of this project. I like the street engagement. Um, I wrote down here, I hope they'll plant substantial trees, and it sounds like they are planting an additional tree, so that's great. Uh, there's not that much traffic on Euclid anyway, so the alley is going to be even less. And since they're just a you know, one lot in from 900 West, I think that the parking access will be just fine off of the alley. Um, let's see. I love the scale of the project. I think we need more of those. If I don't know if you guys went there today, but they just finished a four unit kind of townhouse project on the other side of the street, which looks pretty good. And they also access their parking off of the alley. I park off of my alley and I have never run into any other person coming down the alley, so I think the traffic on the alley is pretty low, and actually getting more traffic on the alley is a positive. I just wanted to mention one thing. <laughs> I noticed as I was reading my letter last night that I sent to you guys that it references time spent on the city council, which is not accurate. I meant to say that I spent time on the planning commission, so I just <laughs> want to apologize for that one error. I'm sure it caused some some interest among the members. That's all Aspirational. I have to say. Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad they're building this, and I hope we get more of those type of projects. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else? Zach? We now know you by your first name. Thanks. All right. Yeah, just going to be short on this one. Uh, Make sure to state your full name. Oh, Zachary Dusalt. Uh, 
I'm in favor of this project. I think it's a uh, good density for the environment that it's in. I like that there's only one spot per per unit. Uh, that's my horse. I'm going to beat it till it's dead all the time. But uh, yeah, in favor of the project. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Okay. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Bring it back to the commission for discussion. Do we want to bring Daniel and or the applicant back? Yes, Daniel and the applicant. Um, so the point of discussion is I'm thank you. I'm glad you've got this picture up here because this is exactly what I want to talk about. Um, because I'm pretty concerned that although we have all of these uh, regulations about entrance entrances and so forth off the street, uh, we don't seem to be concerning ourselves with the actual entrances of the units um, in a in within a, within the, this kind of narrow space and I'm glad to hear that it's not 10 feet it's actually 11 feet um, but I am concerned about um, about the fact that if I open my door and or open my window my window is facing into somebody else's window and I know that there is a simple solution to that which is to reverse the plans on one side of the building and I'm wondering if that's a possibility so that you don't open your door to somebody else's door. Um, it, would, it would offset the rhythm of the building because of the way, like the north units are definitely going to face north and then beyond that they would flip to think through that it would just, possibility. It would just, yeah, I mean it. They would just like this, you know. Yeah. It so, wouldn't, they wouldn't it, actually orient any differently at all. They would orient the same way. I mean, they'd have to worry, and there'd be mirrored plan, right? Is what you're saying? They're mirrored. That's right. Mirrored plan. Mm -hmm. Instead of they're mirrored now, and instead they would be the same building. Yeah. I mean, it's a possibility. It's something we have. And that way, I think windows would not look into each other across yeah. this. I mean, you're talking about a space that's no wider than this desk is long and 24 feet tall. You know, that's pretty, that's as tall as this, this room is. That's a pretty, I mean, it's a lovely picture, but I know that it's going to be a pretty daunting space uh, to be in. Intimate, a little, a little too intimate, you know. I, I can just add, there's, there's not directly a standard that addresses I know there that. Isn't. Yeah. Yes, um, I know. The, the standard, somewhat related to that, is providing a safe and accommodating pedestrian environment. Um, so well, it's, I'm it's not 12 saying it's safe this and accommodating. Isn't safe. I think yeah. actually, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about safety here because there's so many uh, quote unquote eyes on the street here. <laughs> there's quite a lot of eyes on this. Um, um, although it could be. In, if it were not well lit like this, and I don't know what the lighting is on the outside of these buildings, but if it's what you've got shown here, it might not be quite enough. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about trying to, trying to preserve a little bit of privacy for people as you go down, as you approach this building. I just would like you to look into it. As I, as, I, as I look at the plans, I don't see any, any reason why that wouldn't be exactly the same cost and pretty much the same layout. Even on the, even on the upper floor, even on the roof deck, it might be better. If you were to leave the two units on Euclid the same and then just mirroring the back units on one side, it would offset that so the window looks at a door versus a window in a window. Is that like in your mind, is that substantially better to look in their window at the front room versus at their door that will have slightly less glass and? It's 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 window to window that's the problem. The front window to the front window of somebody else's room. So you're sitting there watching TV and you can see 
exactly what they're watching on their TV. You know, so this way they would be. Well, for the record, I mean, I can do that in my neighbor's house, too. Huh? I mean, I live in the avenues, and my neighbor is probably 10 feet on the side, and I can look in their dining room. They look in my dining room. Right, but you don't come in and out that way, and, you know. No, uh, no I, I get that point, but um, if, if we don't have a, a standard here that we're trying to address, um, I, I think it's probably something that reasonable minds can differ on. Well, no, but we may not have a standard, but we are doing design review. So does, if design review doesn't include anything, I don't know. What does it include? Well, it includes the frontage off of the public street, which is the issue. Design review process generally has to do with what is seen from the public right of way. Generally, all the standards are, are related to that. Um, and the pedestrian experience from what Euclid Avenue. Right. Yeah. So if this was eight feet wide, that'd be OK? That would, come, this as, that would be the code. Yeah. Minimum, yeah. Gen with thing was windows in them. Yeah. Um, generally, our mid block walkway um, standards aren't quite the same as this, but they are ten. They are about ten feet to twelve feet requirement. So, just for perspective. And we we can look at other portions of development. We don't only look at the street, of course. Right. But if we wanted to make conditions or changes or modifications in a way, we would need to go back and at least we'd have to base it on a standard. Right. So we'd have to look at those standards that um, are in the staff report, and so find one that that modification needs to be related directly to a standard. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions or discussion? I'll make a motion. Okay, thank you. Based on the information in the staff report, the information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve PLN PCM 2019-00953, PLN SUB 2019-00954 slash 00955, Axiom Townhomes Design Review Plan Development and Preliminary Subdivision with the conditions listed in the staff report. I make a motion by Maureen, a second by Matt. Let's start with Matt. Yes. Wait. Agree. <laughs> Connor. Sarah. Yes. Maureen. Yes. Don. Yes. Brenda. Yes. Amy? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. The next item on the agenda is simply a public hearing. There is no action uh, being requested on behalf of the Planning Commission. It's this proposed city property disposition at approximately 1085 East Simpson Avenue, which is case number PLNPCM 2019-01107. And who is present? Oh, Daniel, sorry. Me again. Yep. I'm sitting here reading the paper. I'm sitting right in front of <laughs> That's me. That's all right. Um, so this request uh, by the city administration for the planning commission to hold a public hearing uh, regarding um, their proposed sale of the city property to the RDA. Uh, the administration would like to sell the property and properties like this one um, require that the city uh, that a city board hold a public hearing to get public feedback prior to the sale. Um, the property involved is um, on the screen. That's 1085 East uh, Simpson Avenue um, in the downtown of Sugar House. Uh, the property is currently zoned public lands and is used for city uses, and that zone limits it to public um, institutional and city uses. So this is a photo of the property from Simpson Avenue um, showing those uses. Um, it's currently occupied by the former Sugar House Fire Station um, that's now temporarily being used as a library uh, while the Sugar House Library is being remodeled. Um, and they also on site is the Sugar House Business District Maintenance Facility. Um, it's the, the small garage um, structure with a little office. That is um, used by public services to maintain the Sugar House infrastructure, the special um, infrastructure that we require um, in Sugar House um, through the zoning. 
So that maintenance facility um, would need to either move or could possibly be incorporated into the future development um, from the, with the RDA. So for significant properties, the city again requires that a public hearing be held. Um, significant city properties include those that would require a master plan amendment. Um, in this case, the Sugar House master plan calls for the property to be um, public lands. Um, it also has policies that the Sugar House fire station should remain where it is. It is not, it's moved. Um, so whether that policy is still relevant um, will come up. Uh, in, also, the property includes two city buildings, um, and this is another factor. If a property includes city buildings, currently includes city buildings, it's considered significant and requires a public hearing. Um, so the process is the public hearing. Um, there's no standards of review. There's no recommendation by the board or commission um, required. Um, public comments and comments from the commission will be sent to the mayor, and the city council after this um, can also require an additional public hearing. As far as any future development potential of the site, um, right now it is zoned public lands, um, so you could do an institutional street, city or a city use, um, but uh, if you wanted to do a residential or commercial development, it would require a zoning amendment um, and it would require a master plan amendment. So those two things would come before this body um, before any development on the site. Um, and if rezoned, it would likely be the Sugar House Business District Zone, um, which developments have come before this body as well, um, because they generally require design review. Um, so that's all I have. We have representatives from um, Real Estate Services and the RDA in case there's any questions um, about their processes. Um, all right, thank you. It. Does anybody have questions for the RDA staff or Real Estate Services? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's move to the public hearing. I have so far two cards. Um, Judy, would you like to come forward? I hope you got my letter. I finished it sort of late last night. A lot of stuff to going on in Sugar House. Record, I can't Judy. stay ahead of it. Judy Short, Thank Sugar you. House Community Council. Um, I queried the trustees of the Sugar House Council and the Land Use Committee and a lot of people that I talked to, and nobody seemed to have any problem with doing this. I think we all expected that it was coming eventually. Um, we've long talked about this plaza as being an eventual transit hub for Sugar House. And it's exciting to think that this might actually come to pass. For us, that would be, and the other piece of it is we're not talking about it, but getting the streetcar up to Highland Drive, that would really make a difference. And then who knows where it goes from there. But we could have, we want, we'd like to have affordable housing up and maybe affordable retailing on the main floor. Uh, so pretend you live in New York City and you get off the train and you could pick up maybe a newspaper or a magazine and some flowers for your wife, or you can pick up a loaf of bread, you know, that kind of transit stuff. And I'm sure we could come up with 82 other things like coffee shops and bicycle repair, a pump to put tires, air in your tires. So we think that would be kind of fun. The other problem we have in the, in the business district is the Parley's Trail goes from the Bonneville Trail down through, you know, along the freeway, and it comes under Hidden Hollow, and it's just sort of there. And then it starts up again officially at the streetcar and goes to the Jordan River. We have no official, this is the Bonneville, or the Parley's Trail through the business district. And so we've talked about this as a spot where we could daylight it, if you will, put it on top of the ground, paint the stripes, make it look, this is the trail with the sign. And perhaps that will help the developers finally get together and figure out where it needs to go through the business district so we can mark all that and make it all come to fruition. Because it might get to the Jordan River before it gets through Sugar House. And I think this is great. I, the affordable component to us seems like it may work because the city probably didn't pay a lot of money for either the fire station parcel in 1960 or the DI 10 years ago, and maybe that makes it uh, 
cheaper for the city to give it or sell it to a developer at a lesser price than what land is going for in Sugar House, and then maybe have more money to allow for affordable housing. I'm not sure how all that works, but we're going to lean on that. And I'm happy for you to give this to the mayor, because I'd like to see this be shepherded through the process. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Judy. We will share your comments with the mayor's office. Um, Lynn Schwartz. Lynn Schwartz, Sugar House Community Council. <clears throat> I hope that the city uses the fact that the land has so increased in value to leverage a considerable affordable housing commitment by a developer by selling it at a reduced price. There is a dire need for affordable housing in the area as luxury housing has pretty much taken over the Sugar House community. We cannot continue down the road of luxury only development and expect the affordable housing issue to solve itself. This is an opportunity that should not be passed up. We have to start to walk affordable housing, not just talk affordable housing. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak as part of the public hearing? Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Um, any comments from the commission that I do go figure go figure I know it's a surprise so to the RDA who's um, I want to point out I'm gonna take this opportunity to make my public comments I guess I want to point out that this would be the last RDA project in the Sugar House Business District we've long expected this lot consolidation but I will say that the only two projects in the Sugar House Business District residential that have a modicum of affordable housing was Wilmington Flats, which is an RDA property, just like this, and Legacy, which got an RDA loan. So the only mechanism that produced any affordable housing was the RDA. And I think it is fair to say you're going to get a lot of um, community council involvement to increase that because otherwise we have seen none. I also want to just put you on notice that um, I was very involved in the, when the RDA zone was active. And one of our main focuses was to achieve um, those parts of our master plan that we knew no developer would do. The Paseo, the Plaza, um, were direct results of us pushing you and pushing you and pushing you to achieve those goals. And I'm sure the community council and other community members are going to um, continue on that line. So whatever comes before us, when you do have this project, I would really recommend that you pay special attention to, because I'm going to, does this further those goals in the master plan that we know full well no developer is going to achieve? And what's that affordable component since you're the only mechanism the city has that has been successful in that area? And those are my comments. Thank you, Amy. Any other comments? I think I would, I, I would perhaps not be as threatening as Amy, but. <laughs> <laughs> I am just laying the foundations for when you come back, then, then you get a happy them Amy. She's very warmly. Yes, she's yes, really I am, inviting. I am just putting you on notice <laughs> right. not in a non-threatening way. Well, um, so what you can expect. My, I think that um, I would agree with that, and I would also be concerned uh, about the RDA's uh, reason to be, so to speak, is, is has not been in the past affordable housing or affordable anything. It's been in redeveloping particular and increasing the value of particular areas. And so I am concerned that there might be a conflict between the RDA's actual um, um, mission thank you and and this project which it would seem to me would be ideally suited uh, for a very low income uh, affordable housing or low income at the very least affordable housing project so I think that that's a comment that I would take to City Council can I just engage you Brenda on that so I'm just curious this is a, a so the RDA's goal is to do that. The RDA zone has expired in this area. Yeah. This is kind of a leftover. Would you not think that they achieved that goal? 
in the Sugar House Business District. I did. That's probably why it's yes. why it's expired. Right. But, no, it but, expires because of time. It's like has a time limit. No, but, but I mean, it's satisfied but the goals. It, it satisfied be. the goals. So yes, maybe it definitely their satisfied that expansion goal. of what they want to achieve could broaden from I set just redevelopment. I, I can't only. answer the question of what the RDA's mission is subsequently, but it was set up to do this. Right. So I'm concerned that if it has to follow certain oh, I rules see what you're saying. in the in the disposition of well, the property. Well, they have definitely accomplished those goals. Right. Could yeah. I speak a little to that as an RDA staff person? So sure. I'm Tracy Tran. I'm with the uh, Salt Lake City Redevelopment Agency, former planning staff. Um, so it, I do want to say that it is the intent of um, the RDA to do some sort of affordable housing project on that site. So I hope that um, rests some fears or you know some of your worries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, as part of the property exchange, so the RDA provided some money for the, I believe, the homeless resource um, centers, or the, yeah, the homeless resource centers. So that that money came out of our affordable housing money. Um, so it would be our intent to put that money towards some sort of affordable housing project within Sugar House. All right. And there is quite a bit of a process. And once we do obtain the property, our first step would be to engage with the Sugar House Community Council and start that dialogue. So we are excited. And we are, you know, affordable, house, affordable housing is one of our main goals and priorities uh, with the RDA and the RDA board. So. Thank you, Tracy. And this is all on the record, Tracy. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this isn't fake? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, with that, I will say we are adjourned. Thank you all very much.